So ons het veel gevra om vraag te vraag vir ons, en ons het gesels maandag, en dit was nou met professor François Venter, en nou net weer voor iemand nou vies raak, dit is een Engelse François Venter, van Wits Universiteit, en, uh, ons, en dat ook twee goed gebeur, weer twee nieuwe artikels, en dit is net verbazend hoe, hoe ons heel tyd leer van COVID-19. Uh, so, a big welcome again. How's it everybody? Lovely, thank you again for, for I mean, in a short uh, notice, but there was two articles, and then we, we, we didn't get to all the questions, but the first thing that, that stood out um, with the corona, and we were discussed it earlier this morning, is like, even like, like the Northern Cape, it really, it's really getting close, um, and it's really getting everywhere, but there was a, a part in, in um, and it's Sky News, so it's not fake news or anything, uh, a part of uh, Italy, uh, people had mild infections, but now, two, three months afterwards, all of a sudden they, they get patients with kidney failure and psychosis and a lot of things. Um, and now they say uh, this, this effects of the virus can be far worse than imagined. It's as if I'm thinking now, if you had it, just still be careful two, three months, still check your body if you, if you realize something is wrong. So I don't know how that study is going. So, so there's lots of data sweeping in, and it's very, as I said on Monday, it's quite frustrating because we're only learning some of the stuff now. So we we are seeing quite a lot of reports of people um, with quite strange things happening a couple of months after the fact. I mean, I think again, as we said on Monday, this thing's only seven months old. So, it, you know, and it really was very based in China till late February. Um, and so, you know, most of the long-term data comes straight out of China. So we, we get all this weird and wonderful stuff that's coming through as to what might be happening in the long term with, the, with this virus. So yes, it's, it is worrying. It also manifests itself in a way that isn't very similar to, to other viruses. You know, we're seeing a lot of thrombosis, sort of the clotting in, in, the, um, in the various organs, particularly in the lungs. Um, and you can see that with some of the uh, with other viruses, but this one seems to be particularly profound. So yeah, I mean, we're learning at the moment as we're going along. And it is frustrating. And then there's a, another article um, that says pathologists found blood clots in almost every organ during autopsies on COVID-19 patients. Um, and that's yeah. also, I mean, it's, that's surprising, but I, it, I just want to ask it as, as well. With, we had a policewoman that died in a, in a flat um, in Cape Town now this, over the weekend. Um, and can that be the reason? You just think maybe it's the flu. You can feel a little, a little bit it's on your chest, but not knowing... Um, that it's actually blood clots that's forming. You're never going to know that stuff until you get very, very sick. That paper was quite odd because we had another paper that came out last week which did only looked at brain by, um, autopsies, and they didn't actually see thrombosis in the brain at all. Um, in fact, what they were postulating is that it's very much focused in the lungs. And you know, some of the other autopsy studies, we haven't seen it in the kidneys and in the heart like this. So I, I need to get that paper... You know, get the hard copy and study it really carefully. What we're seeing at the moment, a lot of papers are coming out which haven't been through peer review. They haven't had other scientists go over it. So you, you just need to be quite careful about grabbing these things. People are, you know, it's the emergency. So everyone's rushing their stuff out. But a lot of stuff has come out that's later on being either proved wrong or being subject to quite a lot of criticism. So I, I just think um, people just need to keep their, you know, their detectors up about science because it's one paper will suddenly get a whole lot of headlines and then comes out and it gets disproved. We've had some of the some of the drug studies that on hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine, for instance, were released prematurely and later on found to be, you know, not to be designed well at all. Uh, and people were taking chloroquine based on, on, on some very, 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 you know, stuff that would never have been allowed in, if we were in normal times. Mm. And then we've got a question, Bets Ferrara. She asked the days of quarantine, um, and it kind of changed. It was 14, and um, now Dr. Karim said, Maybe can, we can take it down to eight days. Um, so I don't know what to do. You know, sometimes people have symptoms even longer than 14 days. So they can have symptoms for ages, for months, you know. Like with most viruses, sometimes you can get cold and you can feel like snotty for, for weeks. It depends on how your body reacts to it. The issue of quarantine is being discussed very intensively at the moment. It's quite, again, I identify with your viewers' frustration. There is um, internal to the government, there's a discussion as to what the, that should be. Um, there is a um, the, the 14 day thing is a very conservative one. Um, there is a discussion about taking it down to 10 days or eight days. Um, and certainly in the European Union, it's, it's about eight or nine days, while in some of the, 
the American states and um, and in, in Asia, it's 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 uh, it's ten days. So I think people will get some clarity. Um, Professor Karim did come out and say that, but I don't think there's been finalisation on those guidelines yet. Mm. And then someone's uh, Antoine Dewey is asking just about the masks. What is still um, you know, uh, legal or not in terms of the uh, KN95 mask? Or is it better for people in the public just to stick to the, the material masks um, to still save on PPE? So, yeah, and look, I think um, we still have shortages of N95 masks. Now, just for your, for your viewers, those are those very, very tight surgical masks that don't let anything in and out. Um, they're quite expensive. They're also quite uncomfortable. I, you know, where I, we used to, in the hospital where I worked, there's quite a high-risk area for drug business and TV, so we wore them all the time. So they're not that much fun. I think for everybody just to know is that just use any old mask. You know, even a cloth mask works pretty well. It might not be, you know, super-proofing you, but it's something that's practical. You know, I've run out of my N95 mask, and when I go to the supermarket or I get out into public, I wear my cloth mask, and it's actually a lot more comfortable and it pretty much will do the job, you know, as long as you, you know, you don't stick around too long. You're not going to, it's going to shrug it off. I think the mask thing is interesting because, it, you know, I used to laugh, like, I've traveled so much for my work. Um, I used to laugh at the Asians because they always wore masks on airplanes, you know, you used to, like, roll your eyes and think they were ridiculous. We now realize that actually this might be one of the most important things, probably even, possibly even more important than hand washing in terms of stopping the transmission of the virus. So... There's a lesson here for, for all of us involved in public health to be a little bit more humble. But yeah, masks, just wear them. You know, find something that works for you. It doesn't have to be perfect. It'll probably do a good job. Mm. And it's quite interesting. People were, were mad at our president when he said it's now kind of law um, for this time to wear masks. And Britain and France joined us yesterday, making it now um, law to wear Austria, masks. Yeah. Yeah, yeah so, I think like... You know, as things go, you know, we all we have to put on clothes when we go out in public as well. It's just going to be a, a, a slightly new normal. I think you just got to find the one that works for you. I, I think a lot of people are worried about rebreathing the carbon dioxide and stuff like that. But honestly, as I said, we like in we are worked in the hospital. This thing like sits on your face tight, tight, tight. Sometimes you you go on for four, five, six hours. You just remember this is what surgeons wear, mm. um, doing long, long operations and things. I don't think you need to worry about that stuff. That's mm. Just find something that's comfortable and then start wearing it. The the, uh, the positive thing about the mask uh, that I realized walking in the, the mall, like I haven't been in the mall for two weeks or anywhere, um, was that everyone's beautiful. Because if you do this with your eyes, you can just, everyone. I mean, I realize now it's the nose and the mouth that, that messes up our faces. But if you just see eyes, everyone's a model. Everyone just looks good. Um, uh, we're going to chat. I've got still got some questions uh, Prof, um, some good questions coming in, so uh, we'll chat after the 7 o'clock news. Lekker. Ons gesels verder met professor François Venter van Wits Universiteit, en um, dit is nou rondom vraag wat jylle instuur. Uh, welcome back, Prof. How's it, everybody? So there's a, a, one question that just came through this morning. It's all, all, always interesting. It's about the shields compared to masks. And I realized if, I, um, if you look at, at, at malls and stuff and the shops, a lot of people in the beginning had this shield, but now they've got mask and the shield because, I mean, I realize now, I mean, it's too open. I don't know if you agree. Yeah, I, I, you know, there, there are specially made shields which do confer a certain level of, uh, of added benefit. But again, you know, if you <clears> quit, if you go into a mall, for instance, and you don't stick around, you, you make sure that it's well ventilated, which most of the malls are pretty good about at the moment, that you don't stick around in crowds and you don't stick around more than 10 or 15 minutes when you're in the queue, you're not going to get COVID as long as you're careful about that. So just a normal mask is plenty. Um, so if you really want to, some of the shields actually aren't well designed. And theoretically, you could actually, um, they could actually spread things a little bit worse. You do need to be a little bit careful about that. I would just tell people, keep it simple, find something that's comfortable. Um, you know, so... That, I certainly, when I go out, I use a cloth mask. It's just comfortable. I don't stick around. I just, you know, I go in, I buy my groceries, I'm out of there. And um, try and spend as much time outdoors as possible. Mm. And then Hanelin asks, is it possible to be infected by someone before any symptoms are showing, such as fever, etc., due to the incubation period? Yes, and that's one of the problems we have, is that about probably about half of people don't get any symptoms. You know, um, or maybe just a slight little scratchy throat, you know, like Joburg winter or Cape Town, even it's uh, 
it's kind of all of us get this from time to time. And so most of the manifestations, certainly in the short term, um, are, are actually very mild in most people. And that's, that is a problem because it allows it to spread a great deal, which is why even if you're feeling okay wearing a mask is a good idea. You're both protecting yourself from contracting it, but you're also if you're just in the early stages and you're one of the lucky ones, um, you're coughing it out and you don't even know you're infecting people. And then Picky Prinsler is asking about the stats comparing normal um, flu in South Africa and people that die of normal flu of grip um, compared to COVID now. Um, we won't know uh, that probably next year only. Yeah, we don't have very, you know, it's a problem because so many people don't have symptoms. So try and work out, you know, how many people actually got the virus. It's quite hard. Now, in places like um, where, where they really went out and they tested everyone in China, in South Korea, um, the case mortality rate where people died, the number of people died is about 10 times more than flu. So I think um, every indication we have from this is it's much worse than flu. It's, you know, flu, I, I don't want to minimize this. I, I'm amazed that people are finally saying, oh, it's just flu. Flu, flu is pretty, pretty bad, you know. It like, wipes out lots and lots of people every year. And people just don't get the vaccine and, and, until this year. Suddenly everybody was getting the vaccine. <clears throat> so I, we think that a COVID, certainly the version of COVID we see at the moment, with flu, you've got a certain amount of immunity. So we've all had it over the years at one time or another, or we've got the vaccine. So we're kind of carrying those antibodies, which tend to mean that we don't get the severe forms. The problem with COVID is that none of us have ever seen this thing about it before. So we don't have the antibodies to it. And that's why probably why it's sweeping through and killing so many people. Um, so I certainly don't think people should be saying, oh, it's just like another flu. You know, this thing is definitely worse than the flu. Mm. If you look at Cape Town, for instance, where we've got really good data, you can see this incredible spike in what we call non-natural death. So in South Africa, the death data, the doctors and nurses actually collect that data pretty well. And most people die in a hospital or in a facility. So that data is collected quite carefully. And we kind of divide deaths into natural things, which is like pneumonias and cancers and diabetes and, and HIV and stuff like that. And then non-natural stuff, which is car accidents, suicides, anesthetic deaths. So when you look at Cape Town, you can see the sudden spike in natural deaths in the last six or seven weeks. So when people say oh, it's just the flu, we can see objectively that Certainly, at the moment, it's much, much worse than flu, and it's contributing to a lot of extra deaths um, in the places that we've got. We'll probably see the same spike now happening in Gauteng, mm. and then it'll hit Brazil and Natal probably in the next week or two. Sure. And then uh, Carla Lochenberg, maybe a different, uh, difficult one. Uh, she asked you about different blood groups. So, so you read somewhere that if you're O positive or uh, your blood type, um, you can be sicker or not. Is, that any, is there any truth behind that? A, there was a single paper that came out that seemed to show us very soft correlation with one of the, I can't remember which one, to be honest, which blood group. Through the years, um, people have been very obsessed with their blood group. You know, it's a very old-fashioned term. We don't even look at it anymore. You know, I remember as I was a kid, you should really know your blood group. But honestly, there's so many subtypes of the, the blood group that we now look at when we do things like give people blood. We do the, the matching of the blood to your particular group, not just on whether you're A or O or B or whatever, or B positive and all the rest of it. There are a whole lot of other things that we do now. It's much more sophisticated. We, with one or two other diseases, there was some correlation with blood groups. We just don't really know what that means. So I, I'm not sure how useful, the, I can't see how useful this would be. So I'm O and I'm slightly more likely to get it. So maybe I'll be... 10 times more careful with my with my face mask. But if I'm over 70, that's those are the people who really need to be wearing the face mask. So mm. I wouldn't obsess too much about the, the blood groups. It's interesting, though. It, um, I suspect that more of this will flow as we go along. Yes. And then one last question. People are very wor worried about, uh, like, your toll gates or where you sign in, you know, you sign in at a, at a hospital, even but everyone's using the same pen. So I think... The thing about the mask, and now you keep your distance, but now you share certain stuff or someone gives you change. I also got changed last week and I immediately felt, yes, I don't know, must I wash this change and I put it in my, in my pocket? Um, you know, so do we need to be careful because we don't know how long this thing sticks to certain um, surfaces? Yeah, and people, are, you know, there have been studies looking at plastic and copper and, um, and metal and and so the thing does sit on surfaces and it can live there, certainly in the case of metal and plastic for a day or two, but just because it's on it doesn't mean you can get it. You know, the, you need a certain dose to be able to get it. And the dose that actually lives on things like pens and that is very small. Mm. We don't know for certain though. And I think that for things like high touch things like that, just carry your own personal sanitizer. That's what I do. 
is like you know handles um, lift buttons pens is a good good example and things like that just use it and then immediately just sanitize in that situation and you'll be mm. absolutely fine it's probably not going to infect you but we, we can't hand on heart know that at the moment people are so obsessed with surfaces though you know i've seen people wash their cars after somebody with covid's been in the car park and stuff and wash their clothes when they get home you're not going to get it that way. You're going to mm. get it from somebody coughing on you or being close to somebody who doesn't know they've got it in a close space. Mm. So I would say be sensible about it, but also don't drive yourself into a neurotic wreck by swabbing absolute, uh, like sanitizing everything that, that you've got. If you touch something and you think lots of people have been touching it, just sanitize and you're going to be fine. Mm. And maybe it's totally not your field, um, but if someone's asking, is diluted jig water enough to use as a sanitizer at your school? And it was Lydia von Fieren. So I don't know if yeah. you can answer that one. Yeah, no, absolutely. Like any of the industrial stuff you have in your kitchen. This, as I said the other day, this is a really, really fragile wussy virus. It just dies. It really is. You just have to expose it to any kind of detergent and it will take out. The, the thing that, that covers the virus is um, you know, any sort of soap and water. If you pour soap into oil... That's what the thing does to the membrane of the virus. So Jig's pretty good. Um, any of the stuff, as I said, that you've got in your sink, even just good old you know, soap um, that you normally wash yourself with will take care of this thing. So yeah, it's probably um, a good idea that Jig and water, just to make sure that you know, that is, these people must be careful about using too many chemicals. But yeah, you can use that as a sanitizer. Mm. Uh, last question. Is there any secret stash of whiskey at Wits? <laughs> <laughs> because then I'm driving I'm through. Like, yeah, I, I, um, a friend of mine saw the back of my, this is all the gift alcohol over the years, and my friend tells me that I'm running a Shabin practically in the back here. So, <laughs> yes, with alcohol bands, all of us are, I think, making sure that we've stocked up at this point. <laughs> Definitely the best sanitizer. Thank you so much, Prof. It's been a pleasure chatting okay, to you. Cheers. Cheers. Yeah, hello for the cut work. Then, else as a kijkie, come some spiel.